Good evening, everybody. I'm Denise Smith with Smith Physical Therapy and Running Academy. And tonight I have a really special guest inside my clinic. It's Coach Seth from Cop Running. Um, he's gonna, we're going to start out just by telling you guys a little bit about what we do. Um, Seth can fill you in on what he does. And then we're going to start going through just having a conversation. At any point, if you guys have questions, just start typing them in. Um, I did have a couple people that emailed me some questions earlier because they weren't able to watch live. So we'll make sure we get to those three questions. Um, but let us know along the way, and um, we'll be together probably for about a half hour. Um, but, you know, thanks for joining us. So, Seth, tell us a little bit yeah. about what you do. Thanks. Well, first, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, go ahead and just tell us a little bit about what you do, your background, sure. how you started your company, and all that. Yeah, well, I'm a local running coach uh, working with people of all ability levels from beginners to so-called advanced runners, I suppose, and uh, we work with individuals, charity groups, uh, corporate groups, um, and really just helping people achieve their goals through running. Um, I myself was not a runner uh, coming up. Um, many pounds ago, I was a football player. It looked much different than I do now, but um, fell in love with running. Gosh, it's been over 10 years now. Um, my wife was training for the 2006 Chicago Marathon, and uh, we met during her training uh during her training cycle, and I thought, hey, you know, I might join her with some uh, uh, for some of her her long runs, and um, it's you know, good kinda, way to start dating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so our first couple of dates were all along the lakefront path in Chicago, but uh, so that was kind of my initiation into endurance running, and I just fell in love with it, and it was kind of what I had been looking for for a few years. Once that um, you know football had kind of left my life, so. Uh, fell in love with running and then um, just really fell in love with uh, with learning about running and um, helping people. Yeah. Would, uh, whether it be initially family and friends and, and I thought to myself, hey, maybe I could make this, uh, you know, into a career. So um, cool. we've been um, going strong now for about six years and uh, I love absolutely what I do. Well, now you guys host a race every Thanksgiving, That's true. Too, right? Yeah, we do. And, and uh, Smith PT is uh, one of our um, awesome sponsors. <laughs> uh, plug there. But yeah, we do. Uh, we host uh, Henry's Thanksgiving Day Hustle 5K, obviously on Thanksgiving morning. And um, what's the story behind that race? Yeah. So our um, our dear friends John and Steph Betts. Uh, John um, uh, went to college with me. Uh, he was a, an athlete at Knox College, and um, their son, Henry, is our daughter's age. Uh, Henry is four, and at the age of seven months, I believe, he was um, diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. And, um, you know, we were, looking at, we were looking for a way to um, start our own event, and it just seemed like the perfect thing to do. We wanted to support that family, and we love them. And, um, you know, Muscular Dystrophy Association is a great organization, yeah. so it just seemed like a natural fit. And uh, we... We always wanted to, we'd always kind of grown up doing turkey trots just for fun with family. And we always wanted to start something that was ours and we could give back to the community. So now we're going into year five. Oh, that's great. And yes, yeah, so it's going to be the five-year anniversary and, and we've, we've increased participation every year. Uh, we've been able to give back to the Muscular Dystrophy, uh, Dystrophy Association every year. So it's just been a really cool way to get involved in the community. Even yeah. More. yeah. Well, so save the date for Thanksgiving of 20, Thanksgiving. 2017. You got it. Um, well, here at Smith Physical Therapy and Running Academy, we work on um, we work really well with the, with Seth's coaches um, and his organization because we work on technique. So our goal is to get you to the starting line with good form, yeah. reduce your injury rates, and then Seth gets you guys across the finish line. So it's kind of a match made in heaven. I think like just that two groups can work together to help people run faster, run longer, and run without injuries. So, um, what would you say are some of the small things that a runner could do in their training to help get the biggest gains, to yeah. make the biggest, you know, I don't know, make the biggest gains? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, as runners, we want to run, right? <laughs> and I was guilty of this too, that, um, you know, if all we could do is run, uh, that would be great. But as we get older, um, certainly we need to instill good habits. Uh, like doing something as simple as uh, doing a dynamic warm up before every run is super important. It's kind of I use the analogy of you know in the dead of winter we experience that here in in uh, the Chicago area. Um, you would never if you parked your car outside you would never just 
go and start it and just take off. You'd let it warm up. Well, it's kind of the same. It's kind of the same theory with with running. So always do a, a dynamic warm up. It doesn't need to be anything more than five minutes okay. in length. Um, that way you're not taking like a mile or so before you finally feel like you're into the yeah. run. We've all had that, right? Where it's like, gosh, I feel really. I kind of feel like garbage, you know, the first uh, the first uh, mile or so. So we want to try to eliminate that. So doing a, a nice dynamic warm up, five minutes tops is all you need, and then really cooling down after the workout. Okay. So I like to call that sandwiching. Okay. So you know, the workout is is the main part, obviously, um, but the warm up and the cool down. And the cool down can be something as simple as a ten minute walk. Just getting your heart rate back down, jump starting the recovery process. Um, this is something that probably I would say 90% of runners do not do, and they're leaving performance kind of on the table, so to speak. And I know you're going to talk a little bit, and we'll talk a little bit more about strength training. Yes. Uh, that's super important. So kind of the, the recipe for success for me is that you would have your warm-up, you'd have your cool-down, um, a warm up workout cool down and then you would have a, a very runner specific strength workout okay. after that yeah and then you really wouldn't be done until all those things were um were finished you know it doesn't need to add a lot of extra time uh, i know we're all busy individuals right so you know you may have 60 minutes tops and that's it that's fine a five minute warm up a 10 minute cool down you've got 15 minutes right there you might do you know a 35 minute run and then leave some time uh, to do you know a 10 15 minute strength workout and then we're in the strength work, uh, workout we're being very intentional so we're focusing on um, the hips uh, core, um, absolutely things that you really, that really, um, single leg strength, things that really make a difference in running are going to keep you healthy. So, Good. um, I think that we should focus and you'll hear this is a recurring theme, but the most important thing is consistency. You're not able to be consistent. You're not able to make those gains unless you're doing all the little things. All right. And so yeah. some of those little things in your opinion don't have to necessarily be done all in one training day. It can be spread out throughout an entire week. Yeah, I would say that, you know, in a given week you're going to have it's going to look fairly similar from one week to the next when you're when you're training whether you're out of season or whether you're in season. You're always going to have that long run which typically we do on the on the weekends, right? Because that's when we have the most time. time. We're going to have probably a, a challenging aerobic workout during the week. Um, we're going to probably have at least one cross training session, whether that be swimming or the elliptical yoga, um, you know, pick your poison there. Um, we're going to have a couple, if not one recovery day or an active recovery day, um, being very intentional with that. But if you have, let's say three runs per week, I really would, if, if, if I'm writing the program, each run is going to have that part of the, um, the ingredients are going to be the warm up, the workout, okay. the cool down, okay. and a strength workout. Now the strength work workout will be different from, from one day to the next, but what we're really going to do is we're going to focus on shoring up any weaknesses and building on your strengths. Well, and you brought up how programs are written, and that was one of the questions from yeah. one of my clients, Meredith, emailed. Um, she had a, her son's swimming lesson, so she couldn't join, but she wanted to know how programming worked. So she's uh, her story was that she's trying to run a 10K. She's yeah. run a couple 5Ks. She wants to up her distance. She doesn't know how to safely increase her distance, um, and what does an active recovery day look like? She knows how to add some strengthening um, work in there, but she's worried about giving her body a rest. So her main questions were, what is an active recovery day? And how do I safely go from a 5K to a 10K? Yeah, those are great questions. Thanks, Meredith. Um, <laughs> yeah, so an active, just to, to address your first question, an active recovery day is I'm a big fan of just constantly being in movement. Like the days of, you know, your rest day where you're just laying on the couch, um, you know, research has shown like that's not very beneficial. Our so body not doing anything. Not doing anything. Okay. So like our bodies are, we're made to move, right? So an active recovery day could be, you know, let's say it's on a Sunday, right? It's just getting out and being active, whether that going and running errands or getting groceries to just going for a walk. Uh, as, with a, as a, with a family, just to again kind of get the blood flowing, flushing uh, any sort of like lactic acid that's that's there. But it, the worst thing that you can really do after a workout, uh, or really in general at anything, whether you're training or not, yeah. is sitting and doing nothing, okay. right? Because that's not what we were engineered as humans to do. So an active recovery would be something like, um, you know, go for a walk with your family, um, do a very easy yoga session. Okay. So like a yin type yoga, yeah. not certainly like your, your hot vinyasa mm -hmm. where it's 95 degrees. And I would consider that actually a strength workout. 
Okay. But so, um, so something where you're being active, but you're not necessarily taxing yourself. Certainly, if you feel like it is jeopardizing the next day's workout, the next day's run, then that's probably too hard. Okay. So, an active recovery is, uh, if I were to put a, put together a program, it's going to be obviously a mixture of running, cross training strength workout, warm-ups, cool-downs, and active recovery. Um, so you're going to have seven days of something to something do, to do um, with uh, varying degrees of intensity, certainly. Okay. So, And then I think the question, the other question was, how do you progress? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the question of progression, you have to be able to check a couple things off the box before even considering going from a 5K to a 10K. Or uh, the very popular question I get right now is, hey, I just ran a 5K. Can I do a marathon this fall? Um, signed up for Chicago. Signed up for the Chicago Marathon. Can you help me? Uh, I get that question a lot this time of the year. And I would say that, um, you know, if you've been doing all the right things, right, if you've been training where your weeks have looked pretty consistent, pretty much the same, where you've been doing a challenging aerobic workout, you've been doing that long run uh, for both, you know, to, to build the, the mental and physical fortitude needed, right to to progress um you you're doing the right things like doing a warm-up doing a cool down um you know you're eating right That's something that we could probably get into yeah. uh, you're eating right what's your sleep look like um and then just professionally i mean we're n none of us here i'm guessing are professional runners you know we all get paid to do something else or we're you know we're busy stay-at-home moms uh or stay-at-home dads and so we need to be realistic too can we fit the extra hours per week in. Yeah. So what I like to do with my clients is, is, is certainly help them make that decision, whether they can make the jump. Um, I would, but all those things that I mentioned is you need to check those things off the list before realistically saying, yeah, I can, because the goal is, is you want to enjoy the experience, yeah. right? You want to get to the start line, but obviously most importantly, you want to get to the finish line. And the only way that we're going to do get there is if we're, we're doing the right thing. So I would sit down with my client, go through a, a pretty in-depth questionnaire and just kind of get real with them and see exactly what they want to accomplish. So if you haven't ran in a year and, you know, Joe at work just signed up for the Chicago marathon and it's something you always wanted to do, that's great. I would never be uh, one to tell anybody they can't do it, but let's be realistic and let's put together a realistic program. Okay. So yeah. making sure that your lifestyle could accommodate, um, you know, what your goals are. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, you know, there's only so much time in the day. You talked right. about this. We have so much happening. So if I can give myself an hour a day to run, right. um, which I think is a struggle for all of us sometimes, but what do I do with the other 23 hours out of yeah. my day? Yeah. it's And really, the other 23 hours of the day are the most important time because, you know, we're, we're working, we're taking care of kids, we're making sitting lunches, dinner, we're sitting in traffic, right? We have long commutes, right? Um, so really it's, it's taking advantage of those 23 hours. So you may, you may get a great hour run in and feel awesome. But if you're sitting for the next eight hours, really you've effectively diminished that workout down to just a couple minutes. It's, it's crazy. Huh. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely crazy in terms of what sitting and inactivity during the day can just basically wash out all that activity in, in, in the training gain. So the things that I like to ask clients are, you know, are you sitting all day? Uh, if the answer is yes, start implementing um, activity breaks. You know, can you get up every 30 minutes to just go walk and get some water? Um, speaking of water and hydration, that's super important. Um, it's one that a lot of people struggle with. But, you know, are you hydrating enough? Um, you know, simple equation that I like to uh, implement is just taking your body weight dividing by two. That's a good starting point. That's the number of ounces that you should be uh, consuming okay. on a daily basis. I would, I would venture to guess that most people fall short of yeah, that. For sure. Um, but I myself like to um, take in about 100 ounces of fluid a day. Okay. Just as a good baseline. Because you're losing fluids when you sleep. Um, you know, obviously, you're losing fluids uh, just as you just as we're sitting here, yeah. right? So you better hydrate right now. Yeah, I know. Um, so what does that look like? Sleep is a big thing, right? Yeah. Sleep is a big thing. That's something I know as a business owner, business owners, we we certainly struggle with, right? So you mean my four hours a night? Four hours a night is probably not cutting it. So 
you know, that's something you have to take into, take into the equation because if you were just consistently getting four hours of sleep, uh, I think I heard a crazy statistic that if you get less than six hours of sleep a night, you're automatically, if, I believe I saw, uh, for the next 48 hours, pre-diabetic. Yeah. And actually, like, you know, being sleep deprived is, is a real thing and it, ca it's, it causes more accidents than drunk driving is drowsy driving. Sure. So you think about that, um, what is that going to do for your training? So like if, you know, this, that, that's something to consider when you're wanting to progress your miles. That's something to consider if you're plateauing, or if you keep getting injured, yeah. you know, because, you know, you can, you can come to Smith PT till you're blue in the face, but if you're constantly getting four hours of sleep and you're not allowing your, your body to, really that's when it repairs and takes care of itself, um, then you're probably not going to be where you want to be. So, okay. you know, that would be a discussion that we would have, uh, certainly. And I would say that not a lot of coaches have those discussions. Right. Right. I, you know, I, I know you've talked to me about it before, and I still need to work on it. So yeah. I think it's like, there's it, always something that we can do to help ourselves a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes that those two hours of sleep might be better for somebody than, you know, Absolutely. an extra hour run my body might need to sleep more right. than anything else right and i think too and just one last thing about sleep i'm certainly not a sleep expert but the topic does interest me and it's not even necessarily like the quantity of sleep you hear like oh you gotta get seven or eight hours sure. i mean how realistic is that i know for me that's not realistic right, at with all, two little kids right? climbing Absolutely all not. over you and, and for most people right so let's talk about the quality of sleep you know, what can we do to make sure that the quality is there? So it's probably not having your phone in bed with you. Um, it's probably not watching, yeah, I know. Um, it's probably not watching TV right before you go to sleep. You know, they carve out time to sleep just like they do for training. Sure. So an this important is, part of their training. Exactly. So we can we can um, kind of copy some of their good habits. So just those are things to consider. All right. Well, and it's um, you know probably part of something that I, you have to have that discussion to even maybe take a look at your lifestyle yeah. to see where your some areas of improvement would be. Absolutely. And I'm a big fan of people having huge goals and wanting, uh, wanting to accomplish big things. And I think that, um, you know, people uh, a lot of times put these glass ceilings yeah. that they can't accomplish something. And I'm one to always try to lift up uh, clients and people. And, and I think that, you know, to me, even over 10 years ago, if you would have said, would have said I ran all these marathons, I would have said, you're crazy. But like people can do just incredible things. And so, and I want to help them do that, but we just need to be realistic in the, in the time frame. Maybe okay. you are completely ready and you're totally locked in, you're focused, and yes, running your first marathon or ultra, you know, ultra marathon this fall, that's totally in line and, and I'm on board with that. But, you know, maybe it's not right right now. Okay. But we can work and we can, we can build and we, could, we can get to that point. So. Well, what about, what would you recommend with like one of those hit or the high intensity workouts. Well, yeah. What about that or working with a personal trainer somewhere in there? Yeah, I think that those are all great things. Um, I think that high intensity interval training is what you were referring to. It's great for great for building fitness. Okay. Right? But um, it should never really replace a run. Okay. Um, I think working with a personal trainer is great. There's a lot of clients of mine that um, also have personal trainers and we work in perfect harmony yes. in some regards, yes. sometimes not always, but we do. And um, it's just, you should be very, if running is, is your main goal, then you should be very intentional. Um, the only way to really get better is to, to run. So plus two with high and, and running, whether it be 5k to, to the marathon, you're talking about a 95% or higher uh, or, um, aerobic activity. So it's not anaerobic really at all. Even a, a 5K is 95%. I think marathons like something like 99% aerobic, right? Okay. So you're doing something that's anaerobic, so it's not really helping you. You need to really build your aerobic engine. That endurance. Uh, that endurance, ex okay. exactly, that endurance engine. So I think that being very intentional, so running um, is going to help you accomplish your goals. I think that that would probably be something maybe that you would do like out of season. Okay. Okay. Oh, good. So like there certainly has winter, its place. Winter, obviously here in Chicago. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. But you know, maybe a place like an Orange Theory 
somewhere for, for sure. spring fitness. One of those you can um, work on that kind of stuff during winter months yeah. or if yeah. it's raining. Okay. Big mistakes. And one last point on that uh, that I see is is people trying to, for example, marathon train and do high intensity interval training and they end up injured. So I'm a big fan of keeping your easy days easy and your hard days hard. Okay. Um, and uh, so a hard day would be your long run, a uh, challenging aerobic run. And your easy days, you'll still run. Um, certainly like an active recovery would be an easy day. But really when you get into the high intensity stuff, you really, um, really increase your likelihood of getting hurt. Um, and then it all comes back to the consistency. You're not able to be consistent with your running if you're hurt. Yeah, so. which is, you know, sometimes where I come in. Absolutely. Um, and I think, too, that some of those days that are maybe your easier days, if you're pulling in some technique work, because um, running is important to improving, but also the skill of running is something that everybody needs to work on. So adding technique drills on certain days or even technique drills as your warm-up yeah, um, are really nice ways to help reduce your injuries. And I'm um, using the active recovery to take care of your joints and your muscles. Right. Um, or, you know, see a massage therapist in there, too. I think helps your body just heal faster and recover from those longer runs or the hard, make keeping your hard days yeah. hard. It becomes easier when you can take care of your body. Yep. I agree. So, oh, I agree. that's great. That's yeah. great advice. Well, so. I think, I think we have a few more questions. This, this might be more up your alley, Denise. So we have a question here from the audience. Um, it looks like this is from Sarah. What is the difference between pain and soreness? Oh, well, this is like yeah. my, Favorite question. Well, <laughs> and I guess this is easily described of when do you get the pain? Yeah. So if you're getting the pain at the beginning of the run, I think there's a couple different scenarios that happen. One, people will get the pain at the beginning of the run, and then it kind of eases off, and they don't experience it again the rest of the run. Right. That might mean you didn't do a proper warm-up, or that dynamic stretching, you maybe forgot that, or something else is off, but it's not affecting you. Right. Um, and the other time people get the run will be, or the pain during the run is then it starts maybe they notice at the beginning of the run and then it goes away for a little while and then it comes back and then it keeps getting worse and worse and worse as the run goes on that's where you want to start maybe thinking right. about getting an injury screen from a pt or talking to somebody um wh wh whoever your referral source would be and or, you know the doctor or an orthopedic doc um or if you're getting the pain during your run and then you're also noticing it during other activities so going up and down the stairs right. um does it change with certain shoes that you wear? Are there certain running shoes that you wear or certain height shoes in your everyday life, heels versus flats? Right. So kind of making, uh, I have this one patient, Dave, who is a rock star. He keeps a pain log. And so he's <laughs> able to say like, okay, I noticed it at mile seven, but he didn't notice it again at all. Or I noticed it because I was sitting for seven hours as I commuted to Iowa. Right. Um, and then I had it when I ran on the treadmill, but not on a trail run. So sometimes that tells me a lot and can answer some questions. And it might help start you, help you see a pattern. So I noticed I didn't do a warm up at all today, and then I got it at the beginning of the run. And once I was warmed up, I felt great. Or um, I always get pain after I strength train, after I do squats. So that's where you wanna, um, you know, talk to a PT. We all do free injury screens. Right. So um, you know, find someone that works with runners and that can maybe help yeah. you. So it's you a know, great question. One thing you mentioned too, it comes back to like, what are you doing the the other twenty three hours of the day? Or is like with women, a lot of times wearing heels. Right, so you go from you know a, a running shoe to a heel where your your heel is elevated, and um, you effectively shorten your heel cord, mm -hmm. right? Tight, and so you're tight, you're tight, tight, right? And you're in that all day, and then maybe you go from work to then going immediately to a run, and you experience pain. So that's another thing too is considering you know the footwear, which I know oh, we have yeah. a question here about about footwear, but uh, you know too um, if the pain is is certainly making you alter your gait. Yes. Right. That would be that would probably be cause for concern. Well, and and I think it goes back to caring, putting that time in in your active recovery days to really giving your joints um, the love they need. So yeah. things like yoga that incorporates strengthening and mobility and flexibility, Pilates, those kind of things where you're working on stability and balance and strength. Yeah. are really important in active recovery days because then you're giving your tissue tendons, your bones, the um, love that they need to help prevent an injury. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to go back to technique work. It's what I love to talk about because I think that people have a tendency to get hurt 
or can't perform as well when they don't really know what they're doing. Yeah. And so it's really common for people to do really well with a 5K. And then maybe their next goal is a half marathon. And, you know, that like 13 week mark somehow when they're really starting to up their mileage, um, they start complaining of yeah. pain. And it's because now their form was good enough to get them through a 5k but now that you're adding more mileage longer runs maybe not knowing how to sandwich your workouts right. um and if you're not doing it correctly that's when the joints start breaking down so that half marathon if you're training for a half marathon my number one recommendation would be to um, work with a technique specialist because you want to make sure your form is solid to help prevent anything that's going to stop you because you don't want to get to the starting line and be so injured that you're not yeah. able to even finish or you're hobbling through the end. And then you just think running isn't for me. Yeah. That's and I think the last both thing you want. and I agree that that is the most disheartening thing that we hear is maybe I just shouldn't be a runner. And yeah. no, you could be a runner. You just yeah. have to be smarter about it. Right. Absolutely. Um, so I think we, well, I think we brought up shoes. Yeah, we we, did. we got a question from Brian about shoes. Yeah. Um, he emailed me as well. So his question was, what shoes do you recommend? Yeah. So what's usually your recommend? This is probably the number one question I get. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I get a lot of questions about shoes and, and I used to actually work at a running specialty store. And so have experience fitting people. And I think when it comes to shoes, it's, I like to say, listen to everyone, but follow no one. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, I would say the most important thing is, is go and get fitted, right? By somebody like at a local running store, like a shout out to the running depot here in Crystal Lake. I know who uh, Denise um, partners with. Um, there's a lot of them out there, right? But um, the worst thing that you could probably do is just go and pick out a pair of shoes that you thought look good from like Kohl's or, you know, JC Penney's, you know, nothing wrong with those stores, but you wanna to go to a running specialty store and talk to somebody who's been trained, can watch you walk, run. Um, you wanna try on several different shoes, yeah. right? And just because maybe necessarily, uh, because I run in Saucony's or Ultras, that doesn't mean that that's the right shoe for you, right? Because we all have different foot strikes, we all just anatomically, we're all different. And so I would say go somewhere, get fitted, try on a lot of different shoes. And when it comes down to it, once you find kind of like the category that you should be in, whether it be neutral, stability, the, the, the varying levels of stability, once you kind of find that, then just you want to make the decision off of comfort. Yeah. Right? Because you're going to be putting a lot of miles on your shoe. And then once you get your shoes, you want to use them just for running. Right? Um, so not like taking the dog for a walk in no, I mean, maybe you could do that, but you just... You know, you don't want to do it and then, you know, maybe do your boot camp. Okay. Right. Okay. And it's like, because any sort of like lateral movement will start to break the shoe down. And really, um, you know, I hear another popular question with shoes or like, how long would the shoes last? Yeah. Is well, there I've, certain miles? Yeah. I, I've seen a guy burn through shoes who was a, a crazy heel striker, a bigger guy, 250 pounds. And he went through a pair of shoes in like 60 miles. Right. And I've seen people get a thousand miles out of a shoe. So obviously that's, that's very um, unique to the individual, but um, you know, you'll hear uh, people say 250 to 500 miles. So um, I wouldn't necessarily let that answer deter you. I would just, again, go based off of comfort and then use your shoes, set them aside for just running activities. Okay. Yeah. What well, my, my advice on shoes is I just did a whole video on this cool. um, last week, but I, I just don't want people thinking shoes are going to fix your form. Correct. Yeah. You, you, if the shoe fitting expert notices that you're an overpronator, an over supinator, we have to go back to the question of why. Is there dysfunction in your foot or is there dysfunction in your hip maybe that's causing the entire segment to be too wobbly? So I sometimes think people will get a shoe with more cushioning because their foot is hurting, yeah. thinking that the cushioning is going to make the foot pain go away. Well, it might, but there might be a reason you're getting foot pain. So um, my advice would be, again, just keep asking yourself, well, why am I getting the pain? Is it because the shoes are just old? You know, maybe the support's starting to break down. You love this version of shoe, um, and you're hesitant to switch because now they don't make that one anymore. Um, but I would just go back to, like, well, why am I overpronating or over supinating? Yep. Um, we did get a question from Jennifer who, who said, um, what's the most common mistake in form? So... I'll take this one. Yeah. Um, so thanks for asking, Jen. Um, I would say it's overstriding. 
Like people ask me all the time, what's better, heel striking, midfoot striking, forefoot striking? I, I, that could be a topic for another day, but I would just say if we can eliminate overstriding. So overstriding is where you land ahead of your hip or your recovery or your trail leg is lagging too far behind you. Yeah. So that distance is a big stride. So overstriding through that is really detrimental because you're either landing way ahead of yourself, which means you're on your foot that much longer, right. more impact time with the ground, which I want you on and off the ground super quick. Um, so reducing the rate that you're coming in contact with a hard surface that isn't going anywhere. Um, and when your leg lands out straight in front of you, your knee might lock, your toes might be up in the air, which is going to cause a lot of um, force through your shins. Um, or that force is traveling all the way up even right. into your low back. Right. So reducing the amount of time um, that you're on the ground is is key. And so shortening your stride up a little bit. So, um, That's a great question. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so do you have anything else that we want to talk about? We, we'll probably do this again in a um, couple months as I think people are starting to, whether you're training for a 5K or a half or a full, maybe as we start getting, yeah. um, I'd love to have you back again to talk yeah. about, maybe we could really dive into some marathon training as people – because the Chicago Marathon training, now you do specialty programming for charities all yes, the time. So like New York Marathon, yeah. you do some specialty training. So people can email you, call you to say, all right, listen, I've got this race I'm doing it for. And you can help tell them when they're going to start training. So if yeah. we take the example of the Chicago Marathon, right. when would most people start their marathon training to run in October? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the Chicago Marathon is on my birthday this year, October oh, 8th. Okay. Uh, very birthday. excited about that. The 40th uh, annual Chicago Marathon. So it's very exciting. Um, so in a standard 18-week program would start with the week, uh, the first full week of June, like around June 4th, okay. 5th. Um, usually anywhere I will do between an 18 to a 22 week program. So generally for the charity groups, I do an 18. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's 18 weeks. So, you know, four plus months. So it's a huge time commitment, yeah. right? But uh, don't let that deter you. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're watching or you're going to be watching uh, here later, and you're considering whether it be to train for a marathon or you just really want to get started in a running program or even a walking program, um, a great way to kind of get started is um, come out and see me on Wednesday nights. Oh, for your fun right? runs. Yeah, so I do a 30-minute When's group. our Smith PT fun run? Yeah, we gotta, we're going to have to – I think it's late May, right? Well, Check May. that out. So you can come run with – and then and then yeah. we'll go to Crystal Lake Brewing after. Absolutely. <laughs> um, oh, May 24th. May 24th. So that would be a great time to come out and meet Denise and I, um, if you haven't met uh, Denise already. Um, but yeah, so that'd be a great, because I, I welcome everybody. So whether you're there to just walk for 30 minutes or run walk or, or run the entire time, we have all ages, um, all ability levels. Um, and I've been doing that for, gosh, a good five years. Yeah, uh, so 50 it's weeks kind of, of a non-judgment zone. Totally. Times yeah, totally. You know, I, that's, that's, uh, it's judgment free. So um, no one should feel out of place. Yeah. Um, Michelle, Oh, Michelle said she would just meet us at Chris Lake Brewing, um, and she doesn't run unless she's being chased. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll chase you. So <laughs> That's awesome. No. Um, all right, well, why don't you just tell people how they can get a hold of you? And... Yeah, well, they can find me on the Internet. Um, at um, You can check out our website at Cough Running. It's um, under construction right now. Um, we are developing a new website. I'm very excited about, but um, they can find us. We're most probably active on Facebook, so okay. we're just at Cough Running, um, and we tweet a little bit of Twitter uh, on Twitter at Cough Running. So, okay. Yeah. Um, and you can go on our website, smithptrun.com. We do have a bunch of classes coming up on some running technique stuff. Um, we're changing up the dates, some Saturdays, some Sundays, weekdays, um, just because we know that people, yeah. you know, can't always commit. Um, and this isn't our first time doing something like this. I, I would also yeah, say yeah. there are a few, um, I guess, recorded webinars on my YouTube page. And we did one last summer, yep. um, kind of along the same lines, uh, just really focusing in on, on technique work and, and really just how, kind of how to stay healthy, right? Because yep. that's, that's the theme is we want to be consistent. So um, Denise had some really great nuggets there. So we can um, direct well, them to And that I think too. your um, YouTube videos are i think are helpful and those podcasts or help was it a podcast or it was like a, it's a recorded webinar okay, i would I, what i would recommend doing is finding it and maybe it'd be great to just listen to while you're working out or on a run yeah or maybe on your commute yeah. um, well because he brings yeah. in um, some really great specialists on nutrition 
um, and you know other topics that I think all runners have questions on. So Absolutely. I think it's a good place to start. Um, and obviously, you're on our um, Facebook site, Smith PT nice. Run. We're also on Instagram, and um, so. We love seeing you guys. We love having you guys join us tonight. So thank you for those that watched it. Or if you're watching this later on and you have other questions, don't hesitate to get a hold of us and we'll make sure your questions get answered. And so, again, maybe we could bring you out in like June or July as people are starting to up their miles and we can talk a little bit more about um, safe ways to progress miles yeah. and some any other tips you would have. I think that'd be great. And hopefully I'll see a lot of you on May 24th. Oh, yeah. Yeah, May 24th. That'd be great. Whether it's at Crystal Lake Brewing or just here at the clinic, One we'll go two. from there. So we'll have a good thanks, time. For, yeah. uh, thanks for coming tonight. Yeah, thanks for having and, me. Um, thanks for joining us. So you guys have a great rest of your evening, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. All right.